Well, good evening. Welcome to the Visions and Voices event. Uh, my name's Henry Jenkins. I'm a provost professor of communication, journalism, cinematic art, and education here at the University of Southern California. And I'm gonna be your host tonight. This event is, apart from the money from Visions and Voices, which generously supports this whole suite of programs in art and culture here at USC. We also had received some great help from, of course, the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism staff, who you'll see doing their jobs at various corners here, and uh, the USC Comics Club, uh, and the USC Women and Gender Studies program, all of whom have helped bring about the event here tonight. Um, I'm up here because I teach a course here at USC on comics and graphic storytelling, which I'll be teaching again next year. And I have a few of my students from last time out, out, in, out in the audience. Uh, and I'm also working on a book that's tentatively called Comics and Stuff. And I'm very interested, as I think you'll see in Carol's work, in the stuff of everyday life. Um, someone called Democratic Debris. Uh, the sense of material culture that we build, we surround ourselves with. And, uh, you know, particularly I'm interested in the problem of the early 21st century of stuff that was meant to be disposed, hanging around, carrying cultural memories with it, carrying emotional baggage with it, and how we deal with and work with that stuff. And I, I, my idea is that comics are a particularly powerful medium for exploring those themes, in part because there's such a rich layer of texture and detail that can be built into it. And so when I was trying to think about who to include in the book on comics and stuff, I stumbled on the first volume of You'll Never Know by Carol Tyler. And it just really clicked for me that she was telling the story of her parents' generation, but also my parents' generation. And there were so many details in this book that resonated me, with me that left me feeling like I knew Carol, I knew the world she'd grown up with. And we've discovered today, I think, a lot of strong emotional connections to, since to bring, bringing her because of those common histories. And I was intrigued at the power of this, graph, this series of graphic novels to tell the story of the greatest generation, as they've been called, but also to puncture that story at the same time, to, get us to look beneath the hood, so to speak, and understand what she calls in the title of one of her book, the collateral damage that still may be experienced from that generation's exposure to World War II and its, af its aftermath. So tonight, Carol is gonna share with us her own stuff in her own life. She's gonna show some of her process, some of the tools she uses, some of the ways she built on her family history to construct this book, and I'm gonna periodically jump in with questions and draw her out. We're gonna do that back and forth for a bit, and then we'll open it up for some of you near the end of the period to ask questions as, as well. So that said, uh, Carol, do you wanna get us started? I just wanna say hi to everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm gonna start talking about yeah, the stuff. Start. Well, before we start talking about the stuff, I want you to know that after we're through, Come up and look at the stuff I brought. Um, I have a little conflict. I know it's Super Bowl coming up. And on the plane, I had a major revelation. It's a red suitcase. And yet, on the front, it says, Lady Baltimore. Uh-oh. Which team am I for? <laughs> anyway, I have the suitcase. I did bring some original art, the back end of book three. I have some originals to show people who are interested. I brought the originals from the army story that's in the book. I keep them in this air maze tie box that I found in the trash. Um, brought a hat, never know. And um, I brought a bunch of like stuff. It's just here and you can take a look. So we have these slides pictures, please don't judge me by the fact that my toenail color is different than the dress. <laughs> Sorry, but this is, this is from, um, this is kind of how I got started artistically. Well, not really. I mean, I got started drawing on the backs of 
envelopes when my parents got bills back in the 50s, or take a grocery bag, cut it open, and kind of work on the inside part of the bag. So growing up, I did not have the luxury of art materials or even um, parents who were motivated to send me to art anything. Uh, it's a working class situation I came up in, and so uh, this was the great day when I was chosen for the catalog at Syracuse University. I was a master's in painting, making those little strokes that I still make today, but making them in paint. This proves that I lived in California. It's my old license tag. Um, <laughs> I started, I did most of my career uh, beginnings in California. And this is um, Aileen sold me and Justin their old car. Uh -huh. And so this is actually Aileen's old car, but we drove it around for like 10 years. We bartered artwork to get the car. And I remember that there were like, play, there were, uh, Robert doesn't drive. So at one point, Justin said, you know what? We should just like auction this. This is our crumbs floor mat from the car. Maybe some collector would like it. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. OK, okay. next. <laughs> okay. Um, OK, this stuff here, this is in one of my old, this is one of my old comics called Gone. And I, I brought this because I just wanted to show everybody. Yeah, there I am still adding a little cross hatching and stuff. But uh, I just wanted to show that uh, kind of style, kind of a combination of wanting to use color and uh, ink. The thing is, when I started drawing comics, I came from, you know, very seriously and fully from the world of paint and then had to uh, learn the old timey cartooning techniques with black and white because technology did not allow at this time yet to do color. So around this time in the mid 90s, this is from the mid 90s, they were drum, drum scanning was invented. So I could do this kind of work, and it would pick up all the subtleties. So whereas before in the old comics, they'd have to do color separations with ruby glyph and all that kind of stuff, but not anymore. So this was like, yes, I get to do color in comics. Keep going. Next. Yeah. And I'm also known for being one of the Twisted Sisters. Uh, there's uh, uh, Aileen Crumb. This is from her book, Need More Love. Uh, that's Phoebe Gleckner, Diane Newman, and there I am in a vest and no bra with a glass of wine. Look out. <laughs> so okay. tell us about the that Twisted Sisters. That was in LA, sisters. actually, yeah. huh? Tell us about the Twisted Sisters. How, wh what was that intervention about for you? Uh, well, um, Aileen and Diane were very much a part of the early 70s comic scene in San Francisco. And uh, there was like... Um, it was like something going on with women's comics and politics, and then Aileen and Diane, as Aileen says, we liked men, we liked to sleep with men, so we had a problem with the feminist cartoonists who wanted us to talk about issues. So they kind of did a little offshoot of that and did a, a series called Twisted Sisters, and then they opened it up to others, you know, other of us twisted types to contribute to the magazine. So then it became a book, and Diane edited it and put it together. So this was. When the Twist, Twisted Sisters, you've got that one, where's that Twisted Oh, sister? it's over there. Okay, the Twisted Sisters book came out. This was a little book tour. I think actually this was in San Francisco, although there was a, at La Luz de Jesus gallery here, there was a show. <laughs> so that might have been from that, but that was back in my no bra wearing days. Okay. I had to cover it up with a vest. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that book there. Twisted yes, sisters. here it is. Okay, All right. you want to move? Next. So I just, we included oh. some of, some images from that, That's that right. period. Yeah, man. Um, ha, I tried to think of all the guys, you know, thinking about, okay, how am I gonna <laughs> sum it up? I can't. So it just became this image of different bottles, you know. So there's different types of guys, from the wet noodle to the maestro dude to the Mr. Fix-It, et cetera, and they've got this lady, you know, this, dolled up lady type who was trying to select. She had a collection. That's my collection. That's okay. supposed to be me in an idealized form. OK. Yeah. Next. Oh. <laughs> Anybody here had a baby? 
this is the thing. This is true. Okay. <laughs> I had my kid. It was unbelievable. Nobody told me that your body went through hell. So I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to put this out there. But I'll tell you what, it, it's a horrible. I don't know if you can read it from a distance, but it's everything from the varicose veins to, you know, no shaving is a low priority, shaving your legs, low priority, all that kind of stuff. And here's this, like, <laughs> baby, right? Doesn't know, ah, I'm going fucking crazy. My body's gone to shit. So I wanted to show the contrast. But the funny thing about this was, uh, Turner put it, Ron Turner from Last Gasp, he made some t-shirts for me. He put, he, <laughs> there was a store in Sacramento called How Tacky, and they had like penis salt and pepper shakers and stuff like that, you know, that kind of goofy stuff in the store. So I showed up with my t-shirts. I thought, yeah, they'll love it. How tacky. So I go in there with the shirts, and she's like, Oh, uh, ooh, I don't know. Let me ask my partner. She's had a child. Uh, we'll let you know on Monday. So when I went back on Monday to get my shirts, she just went, no, thank you. And I said, why? And she said, my partner who had a baby said, it's nothing like this. And I said, she did not have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's striking that the underground comics really tried to put it all out there in terms of sex, but I think one of the things you, you really brought in was the bodily realities of motherhood. And Although Aileen is on a toilet on the cover of one of her comics, you know, I was motivated and inspired by that. But yeah, I've never uh, felt like, uh, I, I always felt like I was fair game, my, my, own, my own life, and that uh, whatever it takes to get the idea across. So if I have to, you know, make myself look hideous or whatever, you know, I want there to be a resonating truth in everything I say. So it's like, Tyler, that's a brand you can trust. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. I don't know. All right, next. So I was just struck Ooh. when we were putting these together this afternoon Sorry of the, the image from You'll Never Know of your father, mm -hmm. which does some of the same dissection of the male ana anatomy that you're, you're, you're doing in in the other yeah. image. And I wondered what, what you thought about as you constructed this image of men. Well, see, this was from a whole different uh, vibe. When I was doing the motherhood you know, chart, it was like, yeah, I'm pissed that nobody talks about how awful this can be. And I need to, I need to enlighten the hordes out there. And maybe it's a birth control device. I don't know. <laughs> but. Um, in this, it was a totally different tone because I was at a part of the book where I needed to show um, my dad as a builder, but yet he was facing a major health crisis. And so it's just, well, he just, uh, about five minutes after he started this house, started building a house in, in his mid-70s, he, he had a bug in his ear, he said. He had to go to the doctor because something felt wrong in there. He said, oh, man, something wrong with my ear. It turned out he had a bad case of cancer. So it was like, whoa. But it didn't stop him from continuing construction on the house. So just that motivation he had, I thought, oh, instead of the plan for the house, I'll show the plan for his like treatment for his health. So, so that's kind of what, you know, you can see the roof is not complete and it's in, in progress. And in the book, it's contextualized appropriately. But um, I never thought about that I did two anatomy charts, but I guess yeah. I did. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, next. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is an example. Uh, when everything was in black and white and the color drum scanning thing started to come up, I thought, okay, I want to try to approach color. God, this is a long time ago. Um, I'm trying to frame it, maybe 90s. Let me see if I can do color in a specific way. So that's why I gave it assignments. You know, I did like the whole, everything else in this kind of tone. And then I did like anything that had to do content wise to the action, I put that in bars on the side in color. So I'll just read one panel, like um, 10 a.m., I'm complaining that the thing she needs to buy for her little friend is so expensive. So there's the color of the pony, the party dress, and the checkbook, and so on. So, yeah. so we're looking at mostly stuff that's in yeah, late that's bloomer, late which point. is where she's gathered a lot of her earlier, earlier work. Yeah, that's 20 years of, 
uh, I did that during the 20 years of raising my daughter. In fits and starts, it goes through, um, let me see that a second. Sure. I, I set it up this way. Okay, which, which glasses do I need? The readers, the distancers, which ones? Okay, so <laughs> late bloomer, there's the cover. And for those of you who are into gardening, these are in fact late blooming varieties on the spine. I know my flowers. Okay, in here, Crum wrote my intro, you know that. <laughs> All right, and my daughter, awesome, she drew this. She's great. Okay, um, I framed it this way. Anything that was published in the 80s has, here she is as a little girl on a, I, I kept a, uh, like a blanket right by the drawing table and I would do my work and she was always just right there. And she, she didn't have any options. I'd say, honey, uh, draw a kitty. Okay, okay, she'd have to draw it. So uh, this is all that stuff. Then in the 90s, it looks like there's more work, but it's really shorter pieces because I was so busy. Here she is a little bit bigger with the pet, you know. I've got a little bit more done on the drawing. The chair is worse for the wear. And here's the work from the 90s. And then in the 2000s, when we hit that, she's grown out, if you notice, but there's a skimpy bathing suit all along. She's got like big baby clothes and a little bit smaller. And by the time we get to this age, she's got a tiny bikini on the thing, but she's drawing. She still draws to this day. She teaches an illustration class at University of Cincinnati. Go, Julia. Okay. okay. We're going to talk about my book, You'll Never Know. Sepia Tone. Okay. This is a book that came, the information and the, uh, the, the idea came during a time when everything else in my life was going kablooey. So it literally was that dad called up one day and dad calling up, I should back up a little bit on that. My mom had had a stroke. My mom was the telephone lady, the one who had gotten, you know, here, talk to your dad. Hi, dad. Okay, blah, okay, blah, 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 and we'd get back to talking. And then once she had her stroke, a lot fell on him. And for him to call was like shocking because he, did, he just didn't call unless there was a reason. So uh, that was, this is from the time when I went over to videotape him after he had called and said, rivers of blood. I was like, dad, what? Well, hi. You said, what? Rivers of blood? Wait a minute, let me get a pen. Okay, I'm trying to write. In one telephone conversation, he said everything he had ever had built up inside of him for 55, 50 something years, 60 years since the war. And so I wrote it all down. Then I lost the notes, believe it or not. And I had to go over and videotape him and verbatim. He said everything that I remember him hearing, or I remember him telling. But the thing about with dad was he would get to a certain point in the story and he would just He'd tell the story with one face turning this way, and then when he'd get to this point, he would just go like this and turn his head and say, cut that thing off, I don't want to talk about it. And that's what was interesting to me. What's so painful that you can't talk about it? And that became the quest in this book, because my life was falling apart at the time. My husband had left, and I was a single mom, and here's dad, and I got this incredible story, and I had to pursue the information to take the drama or take the, take something off of how bad I felt in my real life. So, okay. and this is you know this is the information I had. Dad standing by a wall in Dijon, 1945. Where? What's this about? But he's the main subject of the book. Okay. This is the cover of book one. That photo is about this big. His official army like tiny little thing that they give them. They take their pictures, headshots or something for the passport. But I had to reconstruct it. It's physically, it's about this big in truth and get the likeness. You know, you just kind of get in the zone. You have to do it. So that's book one. Book two, 
the editor, Kim Thompson, said, I want your picture on the cover. I want you to put one of the army patches and anything else you want. So the first book one has wood on the cover. This is lace because it's a little bit more about the collateral damage that what happened to me and mom and stuff. And that's me in fourth grade, and there's dad. By the time I got to the cover of book three, okay, it's stone. I just wanted the book over with, so I was like, ah, just knock on a picture, <laughs> come on. That first one I had labored and obsessed over, but this one was like, all right, I'll just So say a word about the titles, Carol, because uh, they're each very evocative phrases that you use to divide the three books. You'll never know, and this came to me as clear as ever. You'll never know, book one is going to be called A Good and Decent Man. And book two I will call Collateral Damage, and book three, Soldier's Heart. It was like that, and I was like, yeah, I got the book titles. That's great. That'll help me to get into the telling of the story. Yeah, so A Good and Decent Man, the intent with book one was to uh, express to the reader who this guy is and uh, what his values are, how they affected me, what my values are, what's going on, and some of the kind of the plot points that I had to build a story around from real, you know, you have a real life, but you also have to work a story into it. So um, I had to uh, focus the first part mainly on him and what's going on with him. The second book is more about, okay, what did his emotional state, in other words, the damage from war, what did that do to me personally? And how? <laughs> my problems, my problems, how much of that is rooted in his emotionally shutting down because of what happened. And in book three, Soldier's Heart, if you know what Soldier's Heart means, in the Civil War, that was a term given to anyone who had what they call today post-traumatic stress disorder. So someone who had a Soldier's Heart was a wounded veteran that was troubled. So that's where the title from book three comes from. Okay. And these are the five characters. I, I think this is from book two. Um, there's my dad, you know, he's usually in a pair of suspenders and my mom with the hat on, you know, and there's my daughter, Julia. I always depict her as joyful and wonderful. And then there's Justin, uh, always wearing a plaid shirt. And these are various emanations of me, the author, there I am telling about it. Okay, next yeah. slide. There's Dad at Thanksgiving cutting a turkey with the suspenders, and here he is. Go to the next one. That's in their kitchen in Indiana, and my mom and dad um, at some at a 33rd Division. I mean, it's a beautiful picture of him, but the sad thing is he wasn't really with a unit, and this was the only unit I could find. And when he went there, he didn't know anybody. It's kind of sad. So, but he's got his VFW gear on here. Okay. And that's the, my daughter Julia, me, and Justin with our library cards in Cincinnati where I live right now. So say a word or two about Justin, because I, I, we've been talking about him off Justin, and on today, but he's such Justin, an important figure Justin, Justin in the history Green. of comics. Raise your hand if you know who Justin Green is. Okay, Justin Green is the father of the autobiographical comic. He is known for his great work, Binky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary. Binky Brown, when it came out, was groundbreaking in that he was the first comic artist ever to reveal tormented, painful truths about his personal life. And this influenced Aileen, Robert, everybody you can think of in, in comics. Of course it influenced me because I saw that. I uh, had Binky presented to me at a time when I was beginning to do that myself, go from being a painter, and my paintings were always about everything I, you know, that my comics are now, but it was more abstracty. So uh, I can't tell you enough how important, but because Justin is so shy and self-effacing, he's never been a big promoter of his own work, but he's a brilliant genius and he needs to be at the top of everyone's list. If you haven't read it, read it. Okay. Huh. So I included a couple of these from Late Bloomers because you're often asked, how did your parents react to seeing You'll Never Know? Yeah. But it's clear that they've been part of your storytelling from the, yes. the very beginning. You know, I've been using my parents as subject matter since, uh, yeah, since the beginning. And this is, 
this was, oh, this is old, but this was our house. And my sister and, you know, different people will, from the family, they'll say, oh, my God, that's exactly the way it was. You know, Dad always had his feet crossed, and there's that lamp, and there's this and that, you know. So I, I'm very atten attentive to both memory and detail. Um, you know, I don't know where that stuff comes from. I just think about, okay, what did that room look like? Or what would be, absolutely, if I'm not sure of that, because it doesn't matter, because sometimes it doesn't matter, I'm just showing a generic scene. What's the one thing that would make this the right place in time, you know? So prop selection is a biggie. <laughs> I yeah. love to draw shelves with stuff on them and tables and uh, curtains. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> this is what we were just talking we about We were just before, talking about this. Yeah. This is from a kind of, I wanted to show, uh, my parents had a bunch of friends over every Saturday night, you know, and working class, and it was always the same. They'd come in, it'd be cold, the food would be brought in in buckets with stuff on it and trying to put it in the refrigerator, and the men would sit there and get boozed up. And, but the thing about it is, it's not shown here, the language was off the charts. My dad's a plumber, and his nickname was Foul Mouth, because nobody could <laughs> top him. Then there was mush mouth, and this one, and this one. And so every, all the pages leading up, to, you cocksucking son of a bitch, goddamn you. And, and the women would be sitting over there going, oh, Hannah, the ham looks really good. <laughs> nice ham. So they're playing strip poker, or they got porno cards. But then, of course, the next day, they're in church being the ushers. So. Okay. Um, this is a page from book two. Um, yeah, I, did th I put in a couple of pictures here together to talk about your mother a little bit as yeah. part of this. And one of the ways your mother, I think, really comes through here is through the, the, the decorations and the, holiday, mm -hmm. the seasonal displays. Yeah. And we can clip through a couple of these together here. Mm, but she's very seasonal. She should have been a school teacher, could have changed, or the board lady at school that changes the board or something like that. No, she, um, my mom, is, was the family sparkle. She just passed away, bless her soul. Um, but she, um, she was just, she still is wonderful. And she would find a way, very artistic, but from her generation, that wasn't like, I wonder if she would have been like today, been a cartoonist or something else. But you know, you were, you were Rosie the Riveter, then you got married and you had your kids and there was kind of things places where you could fit in. Um, but she was like unbelievably top of the line, set all the records in doing Greg shorthand. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> she could type faster than anybody. Uh, witty, she should have been an ad man. I mean, this woman had it all. And so um, in the book, one of the things that, like here, she, it's Easter and yet it's snowing outside. She's got her bunnies and her eggs and stuff all around. But one of the things I always show is how, through this book, I wanted to capture that magic and that wit of hers. So when he says, this place is cursed, this is during the cancer thing, she says, let's get the hell up. No, actually, that might be before the final version. Those might be, I think she said, this place is cursed. She's always got a zinger up her sleeve. Okay. Go to the next. And this is the 4th of, yeah, 4th 4th of, of July, July, another you know. seasonal decoration. You know. And she's had a stroke and she can't do it, so my sister and I pick it up and we've got, you know, I feel like the last 12 years of my life, I've, all I've done around my family is cheerleading and uh, encouraging, you know, caregiving. Yes, uh, what do you want? You want a sandwich? What do you want? You want this? Okay, I'll go whip that up for you. Oh, but it's oh, it's 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 Halloween. We're gonna put we're gonna put jack o' lanterns on every tray. Woo! -hoo! You know, so I'm like the cruise director and all this fun funny stuff. You know, I come in twirling my baton. Everybody sit down. Sit down. I'm going to show the next pages from the book, and they're like, oh, good Carol. You know, it's just been incredible. Oh, there she is, hanging up the wash, a beauty, but, you know, always with these little humdingers, a garden's worth the trouble. The way I sneeze frightens the children. I get a new dryer next week. Never let misery spoil Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, this is that I actually eventually found those first notes when Dad called up and said, Rivers of Blood. And these are some of the stuff that I just had to quick write down and, and come up with. I wish we could do this in a way that it wasn't going like this so much. But go ahead. Okay. You can look at the back of my awesome hairdo tonight. There's that little, there's from that little group of pictures that became on the front. And so this is what I, this is what I had uh, when I went to do the book. I only had, um, he kept, there were a lot of pictures, but as I looked closely at the pictures, they were all from camp before he went overseas. So therefore, next slide. This is the guy I thought, I thought World War II was just a hoot. And you know, if you look at those Bob Hope, Bing Crosby movies, you're thinking, yeah. What's the problem? You know, here he is goofing around. Um, but then that didn't go with the things he was telling me in the notes. So there was like a little disconnection there. You can see that image. Yes, there's, there's that one. So like Sister Mary, I can't remember her name. I have tried to think of which nun said, go home, ask your fathers about World War II. So when I asked Dad, in high school about World War II, he said, out of hell with it. It was just a bombed out mess. Forget about it. All right. So all I had was this scrapbook he kept of photos and his, and some of the material, you know, some of these patches that were, and there was other stuff around. I was his canteen thing. And, and yeah, this is a panel Probably. from the thing. Okay, this is, um, you'll never know, was the <coughs> song of their era. So when they met and fell in love, um, this was their song. And it became the title of the book for so many reasons, not only because it was their song, but because, you know, it was my kind of like mantra. I could never really, I couldn't really know. I kept wanting more. And then when we'd go to St. Louis to the Ar uh, Army Records Center, guess what? <laughs> All the records burned up in a fire in the 70s, so I can't know that, you know. Just trying to get information and piece things together, it's, it's just been pretty, pretty difficult. Um, I had to read 10,000 Army <laughs> books and uh, a lot of technical manuals. I read the entire series of uh, official war stuff, uh, books, just I read everything I could. Uh, whenever I could. Of course, I didn't read it word for word. You know, I read as much as I could that was relevant. And then there were lots of maps to look at. Maps are cool. I love maps. And then, okay, um, I had all this kind of information and I started to think, oh, I gotta start to organize this. So I, I literally got adding machine tape and tried to draw like how I wanted it to to go across. And, and uh, the there was just, I just got this house and there were big walls and so I was taping things to the walls and trying to figure it out. It's like, because I knew from what he told me and then we had taken this trip to Washington, I knew what I wanted to say and yet how to prep that, how to get you there because uh, I know dad, you don't. And I knew as the writer and person that was going to convey, I had to get you to understand him, know where he's coming from, use my own character as the entree into that substance of, you know, wanting to know. I'm a conflicted character. I got problems. Okay, everybody here, raise your hand if you've never had a problem. Okay, we can <laughs> all relate. So, um, trying to juggle all that and, and trying to figure out, like someone had asked me a little bit earlier, I said, I, I kind of managed it by, I understood there were some clusters of material I'd have to, to put together. Like I wanted dad, I wanted people to understand his craftsmanship, of course. Then I would draw pictures of his studio or his, not studio, <laughs> workshop. I have a studio, he has a shop. Okay, <laughs> so I'd show that. and, and um, his fortitude. So I would talk about how he was building a house while, while going through cancer and it didn't stop it. His cancer, he didn't let his cancer slow him down. 
So there were things like that, little theme things. And then connecting it and kind of pulling it together was part of what um, the challenge was. How do I connect that? Where does it belong in the scheme of things? Okay. Yeah, that's just more. Keep going. And then, you know, I had these charts, and I'd write stuff on the wall, and I had post-it notes, and then this is a whole bunch of stuff. And then I'd, I'd juggle things around and, you know, uh, come up with some kind of a chart, and then I'd circle the things I wanted to use and X out other things I didn't want to use. Stacks and stacks of paper in this one. If you can see over here, let me scoot down. See how it says one, two, three, four, five, six? That would be the way to organize it on a page. So this is the text. And then this will be the first panel, this will be the second panel, and so on. So boom, 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 organization. And then this is the slide of go to bed, 10 minutes later, wait a minute, I know exactly what I want to say. <laughs> when a loved one is in need, etc. You know how you, you can't see, you grab the pen, you just write it down as you're half asleep. <laughs> That's what that is. And I did bring some of this, you know, it just kept piling up. Pages of scripts. Just stuff, you know, post-it notes, drawings. Uh, that's me. Okay. Just, oh, okay. Okay, this was another thing I tried to figure out, how to organize this material. So I took a six-foot table and a magic marker and a ruler, and I gridded off how I wanted the book to be. And then I put uh, the post-it notes around and numbered each one of those little things so that I could, okay, this is... 35 and 36 pages. And then, okay, this is like, then I came up with more complicated, color-coded <laughs> little pieces. I'm done. If I was done with it, or that on a diagonal means needs more work, I think. I don't remember. At the time, it made perfect sense. Oh, another way to organize another book uh, where I, I just <laughs> was just, <laughs> why is this funny? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, this is the, um, every book had uh, an Excel chart, though, because like a dummy, I forgot to number the pages. So I would number them for my, uh, Paul, my production person at Fanographics. And I had a kind of a name for each page, like Army Owes Me, Let Me Down, Problem Solve, Old Maid. And then I knew it was on that page. And then go to the next slide. Then I could go through and say, all right, uh, got to do this, you know, I'd give myself assignments of things I had to do to fix something or to change something around. I think anything that was like brown, green meant my parents now, because I was dealing with current, I'd have to deal with dad as a boy, my mom as a child, uh, me now, oh, wait, me as a child. I had to juggle so many time eras and go back and forth. Go ahead. Okay, so the studio, the setup, uh, at first, I just started working on a table. Go ahead. And this was the last day of work. After eight years, this book took me eight years to do, this set of books. There's my little area. Uh, here's the table. My friend Jack Wu made this table for me. I had a 1940s office chair, uh, different places for di stations. You know, when you're in a classroom, a good classroom is managed by rotating centers. Right? You got stations for everything. So I did that. I had this. So I had, you know, like, that's research and stuff. I had to actually physically build. I have carpentry skills. Yes. I built, physically built uh, this tilt thing, this thing, so I could put, like, army stuff here. And this is all, see, there's those orange air maze boxes. There's one there. And anything that, you know, had to do with, well, go on. There's the tools. There's the tilt table. There's late bloomer. And I had to fit it so that I could take the pages, which I brought some here, and I could put maybe, you know, a dozen of them across at a time, and I could see the, the flow, you know. I didn't want to tape them to the wall, because then you have to fool with the tape. So I built this thing, and, and then I had to, to, for authenticity, I did all kinds of authenticity things, like those are real rubber stamps that I used to stamp the numbers on the military pages and stuff like that. I'm a total nerd, go ahead. And there's like, and there's the tilt table. Oh, that's an additional. I built another type of thing if I needed to see a couple of them together. So that's a, like a, another like wooden thing. Oh, uh, yeah, see, there's my parents. There's the Jeep and some guys on a little shelf. Okay, dog. Dog tells me it's time for something else. Next, there's dad. 
There's Dan Son with his suspenders. <laughs> that is his old growth uh, walnut. And I said, Dad, you know what I'd like the cover of the book to be? I'd like the cover of the book to be a piece of your old growth walnut. Could you cut me some? All right, come on. Okay, an hour later, here he is slicing off a piece of that wood, you know, with just like just like buttering bread. He just set it up. You know. And this is this is one of the pages the of the of the shop, which, mm -hmm. as we noted, figures very prominently throughout <laughs> the book and sort yeah. of is a, your attention to the the detail of the tools and the layout and so forth really comes through very and strong. The, the thing is, my siblings refer to this because it's it's like an archive of exactly what he owns, and so it's like, what happened to that thing? Oh, I mean that? Oh yeah, because listen, this is true. To this day. Okay, you see those lockers? They're from an old high school. I don't know where he got them. He's got a set of lockers. Guess what's in them? Like lead paint from the 50s, uh, something called uh, Paris green. It's terribly toxic old paints that he keeps around because you know, you know, you might have to use this stuff you paint radiators with, silver paint, you know, radiator paint, asbestos, all of it. He keeps it all. So he's got it in, he's got it in the shell. Anything you need, you need a drill bit. Any size, you need anything. You see this down here? There's a vacuum cleaner that sucks up the sawdust, but this is also like a, an old mower that also has something else. That it's constantly, in fact, one day I went out there, he had this piece of wood and a motor and this ca coffee can and this thing. He had actually made a weed, eat weed eater before the guy made, invented them. He made these, oh, what the hell? You know, just a string going around. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> Dad, you invented the weed eater? Ah, oh, hell with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, word got out. Tyler's doing a war book. And I'm sure the thought was, I was going to be like Kurtzman here, and I was going to do a battle book, right? But instead, Thanks. I draw like this. So it was clearly not going to be a book about war, but it was going to be a book about relationships. Relationship is everything. One's relationship to the world, to each other, to your materials, to your time, it's everything. And that's what I wanted to focus on was how this time and place affected him, my mom, why now, what what events? Everything. There's the jacket. It really exists. I wore this jacket. This is Dad's liner from his, it shows on the next slide. There was a fire, a terrible fire in his, the much sought after Ike jacket that he had, uh, which guys only got towards the end of the war because the brass had him during that in 44, but the grunts didn't get him till later. And that's a liner that he had from his old frumpy jacket, the M41. That's what didn't burn up because it was in the garage. So when I found it, I was like, this was yours during the war? Oh, that's so cool. And so I just started adding stuff to it. And I wore it like kind of a, a good luck talisman thing. You know, I wore it during the, my trips across the, the, uh, Indiana to get the information and to be with my parents. Okay. It's also warm. I wear it in the house. So one of the things also, structurally that I felt like I needed to do with the book was uh, to, to avoid chaos, was to <laughs> create some standards, I call them, just standards. This is what I call a six grid standard. So in other words, it's boom, 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 six panel. Next, this is a four panel, a four grid. So I had like some text picture, text picture, but I called this a four. And then this is a variation on the four with a thing down the middle. That content down the middle relates directly to the conversation. On this side, um, I'm over here in Ohio talking to my parents over here in Indiana. So to differentiate, I not only put myself in black and white, but I put them in uh, color for other reasons too. But then I showed, you know, because we're talking about Tom Hanks. There he is there. 
and to draw him. So at any given time, you have to draw something super realistically to sell the idea. And other times, you can kind of just fake it. And this is a 12 grid. This was kind of a variation from the 12, you know, where some of them are combined together. But there would be 12 things. So when I would think about how to put something across, it would be like, how do I do this? Is it a conversation like this? Boom, 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 boom. Or is it? Or is it? Go to the next. Is it that, 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 or? So that's a single panel. And then this is a single panel. Go to the next. And a single panel that becomes a big double spread. So those are the. Those are the four or the, the many types of things. I didn't put anything round, no round panels in the book, no ovals. Well, I do, I do use this later, but within the context, I'm, I'm very concerned about margins, grids, clarity, clean ink, inking, all that stuff, keep going. Pencils, this is how I use a pencil. I remember when I first started cartooning, I said to Robert, um, I said, Robert, what kind of pencils do you use? Because I thought he was going to say, oh, I use a Derwent number five. Or, you know, I didn't know what he was going to say. He said, I use a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. But I didn't like number two pencils. And I've become kind of a pencil geek. I actually use a 1.5 yellow pencil and Ticonderogas. That's my pencil sharpener. It's awesome. I stole it from some, no, I didn't. OK, that's, um, I'll tell you about that later, where I got the pencil sharpener. Uh, Counterintuitively, I found that I liked working on tracing paper. I liked, like I'd come up with a sketch or try to figure out how to do something. I draw it on tracing paper because, you know, I'm working with a 1.5 pencil. And that feels real good. So I would like, and I'd like the idea that I could get like a pentimento or whatever that's called, where you have a little uh, shadowing going on in between the, the, like you make a line, you're sure about it. No, it's not right. You go to erase it. It doesn't really erase. And you kind of go, and OK. So um, then I would take these drawings, and then I could transfer them. I didn't always do this. Sometimes I just work straight up, straight on the page. But then Spiegelman told me once, how can you do that? You need to position it perfectly. And I was like, oh. <laughs> OK, I, I can't always do that. Sometimes, like I was saying to the students earlier, sometimes I'll just go, OK, this next page has got to go. OK, and I was like, what does that mean? Tyler, will you wake up? What, <laughs> what do you mean? What about mm, 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 you know, you're putting it out in a grid? Um, but then there's sometimes where it's just so intuitive. And so I'll follow that, because I, I don't know about transferring a drawing. I just know that there's something coming up that I have to follow. And then from that, something will occur to me, and I'll figure it out. But um, uh, the other thing that <laughs> happened, when I first started doing this book, uh, in a conversation with Robert, he said, in some kind of thing, he said, well, I don't use whiteout, because I don't make mistakes. I do everything, you know, just perfect on the page. And I was like, oh, you son of a bitch. You just upped the ante, and now I've got to do that too. So I honestly have tried to do perfect pages. And then when I saw him, like, a while ago, he said, that's such bullshit. I didn't mean that. I don't really do that. <laughs> <laughs> Cow, what are you talking about? And I just went, oh, you don't know how much trouble that caused me. But there are some pages that I have done that if you hold them up to the light, it's like a lampshade. They're, it's perfect. And I did try for that. Although when that became a barrier to just like my two mantras I was talking about today, be as clear as possible and just finish the goddamn book. Those are my two things. Um, there were times, especially towards the end, it was like just finish the goddamn book. All right, just put a patch on there or just correct it. Or I would get to where I would be putting the text on the side so I could Photoshop correct. None of, none of this was created on the computer. Sketches, keep going. These are just sketches from the book. Sketches, sketches, sketches. OK, stop. That drawing, go back. That drawing became that. 
that's a real place. I mean, it's all real, okay, guys? That's my Oakley apartment. <laughs> Look at this. Where's the pen point? I had to take it off on the plane so it wouldn't be thought of as a, an attacker. <laughs> it's just a pen point, folks, but see? This is what I did the book with. So I, I can't help but note that you probably inherited your father's fixation on tools. Let's just say I take care of stuff <laughs> as, long, as much as he does, yes. I did have some backup characters. There they are. And you know what? This is crazy. I honestly thought I was going to run out of pinpoints. So I went on eBay and cornered the market on 788 oval points. <laughs> I own them all. And that someone else sells them like, this is 10 bucks. Well, I, I have a small fortune there in pen points. OK, inks. I decided that uh, with one of the kind of homage to being a painter, I was, I was really known for my sense of color, which I'm proud of. Thank you, gift. So uh, I came up with this system of colors. I used 53 custom mixed colors of inks that I mixed myself. And I, I, I named them. Go back. I named them. Go back. Go back. Go back. Blood, Magic 50s, <laughs> Denim, Underline, Mud. Go to the next one. There's 15 back here. Denim, Off Moms, Lucky, from Lucky Forward, from General Patton. And then I had to come up with these grid sheets. Because I'd think, OK, I know what the color looks like in my head. Where is it? OK. And I'd get one of these grid sheets. And I'd say, OK, that's called, oh, that's called beer. OK, let's find beer. And I'd go to that or went with the little ones. I had them numbered and lettered so that I could just follow along. F4 meant I could get to the color I was looking for. The whiteout team. Go ahead. Uh, French curves and rulers. Uh, a page in progress. I always do the uh, panel borders first. And one of the things I pride myself on, and you can go back and check, my corners are perfect. <laughs> now, I really work on that, because I think the architecture of building the panel for me starts with really good panels. And then I put in the lettering. And then from there, I start with the some of the things I know working into the things I don't know. Two dogs. Time to move on. OK. <laughs> um, I don't copy, but I do reference photographs because there's no way. I wasn't there in 44, and there's no way I can. I don't have that kind of mind. I mean, I can remember what was on the, the, the table back in 19-something or other, but I, I, I don't have one of those kind of minds. And people that sit around and sketch and say, I, I can't do that. You know, I have to sit down and be real methodical about, excuse me, I'm burping. Anyway, that became the last page of the book, just seeing that lady twirling the kid. I knew I wanted to have a mom twirling the kid. And then when I saw it out in life, I said, excuse me, can I take your photograph? Do you mind if I do that? And she said, no, that's OK. And it became that. There's another one. I said, Justin, I gotta, oh, I'm going to be walking through this crappy area in the segment of the book where I'm like, ruminating about, which leads to this World War I thing. So that ended up being there in the snow scene. Go ahead. Here's the World War I monument. I wanted to make a statement against war in the book somewhere. And I put it in here through World War I, through the poem by Wilfred Owen. Uh, if you know that poem, read the book. You should read it. It's awful. War is terrible. And then um, this is a Kroger gas station, which became this. You know. But actually, I drew this before I took the Kroger gas station picture. I drew it, and I did it, and I thought, what one thing do I need? So really, all I got from the Kroger gas station, I think, was go back. I don't even know. Maybe nothing. Or maybe I just wanted to show that slide. I don't know. No, a lot of this I do have in my head. Go ahead. I wanted to do a Hopper-esque thing back there, a Nighthawks type thing. So this is the one I showed you that was in progress, remember? That's the end result. You know, I had the panels drawn out. And this is, this is at the uh, National Archives in their main hall going through some stuff. 
So, like, you know, I took these pictures when Dad and I went to the World War II Memorial. And t pay attention to that hat. It's hard to see, but this is the sketch. Go on. Thank, thank you. I, I don't mean to be ordering you around. I don't want to be rude. There's the pencil sketches, which turned into this and this, and it was a double spread. If you've ever been to the World War II Memorial, you know how when you walk into that space, it's just so spectacular and commanding. And yet it's wide open. And within the Atlantic and Pacific side, there are these eagles, bronze eagles, and they're holding the wreaths, the victory wreaths. And so what I did was I just pulled them out of there to give the sense of what you feel like when you go there, but to have it be an all in one shot kind of feeling. And then this is like, OK, make something up. This is like I needed to convey a, an idea as opposed to here we are at the memorial. So in this case, I wanted to show, I wanted to tell my daughter her any trouble she had, she could really, if she could just work on the mind, what is the mind? And I, I wrote here all the kind of things I thought the mind, that tell, tell what the mind is, anything from an archive burrito to a sensory processor, etc. But I really, the message to her is to calm down and just breathe, you know. But you can find that on Oprah any day of the week. OK, um, this was, I was trying to um, figure out, this was before you guys were doing the text thing. I drew this, it's one of the first pages I drew where I was trying to show this conversation between my mom and my sister and I. So my sister's thing is in green, my mom's is in red, and mine's in blue. And we're, we're trying to piece together the day the car caught on fire when we were coming back from chemo with dad. We all went in the car like a bunch of jeeters. Come on, let's go, daddy's going to, going to chemo. But it's crazy. So I, I wanted to weave that conversation together. And then another thing I like to do, just because it's fun, most of the reading is done from the upper left to the lower right. That's how we encounter pages. And so one of the things I thought would be fun is to sometimes mix that up. So in this case, you've got the uh, read goes to there, and there's the car. The arrows point you this way in the middle panel, and then back kind of into that way so that you get a flow. Because I had a, I got this panic phone call. I had to run over there. You know, it's a four-hour drive. I had to run over there to some crisis that was going on. Now, this one is the same thing. This was at the first of book one, uh, where I, you know, it, was on, it was page five. And I always call this, this one here page five, because I had done most of the book. I had the front part. I had the back. I had most of the content done. I kept saying, oh, OK, page five, page five. I've got to come up with page five. What am I going to put there? And I didn't know. I, it was I just, this week, am I going to get to page five? Nope. Okay, I don't know. It was just glaring at me and glowering at me for months. And then one morning I woke up and went, I know. I know exactly what I want to do on page five. I want to state the theme of the book, which is not all scars are visible. So that's the theme for dad. Not all of his scars were visible as a, as a veteran. So the, the page before this, he's putting a, he, he buys a piece of plywood from Home Depot, and the ladies at the checkout are chattering, and they don't, and I'm saying, you know, wait a minute, this is this, is this war veteran. Pay attention, people. So he's complaining about the plywood. He puts it in the truck, and he drives through the landscape that spells out, see the Arby's sign? Not. And then on the billboard, it says all. And then it spells out scars on the cars, scars. And then the cows are going, er, are. And then in the clouds, you can't see it on this slide, but it says visible. So I spelled out the theme and yet brought the reader up through the, the page till he pulls in to the garage. There was so much emotion I had to deal with. There was so much you know, coming through. You'd look at an army patch, and it's not just a patch. It was on Dad's coat, and he was wearing it when? Oh my god. When he had no knowledge of time or space, and he had a head injury, and he was out of his mind somewhere in Belgium, I guess. I don't know. So go to the next slide. I realized 
early on that I was dealing with heavy, heavy topics here because I was going to be going to my dad's emotional life and what the causes were, my own problems. I ended up talking about my, the, my mother. I reprinted in the book and framed the book around the loss of my sister to a tragic accident and how that made her life shape the way it is, how that shaped me. And with my dad, it turns out that, um, as he says here, nobody said we had to kill Ill innocent civilians. We had to kill people. Kill the enemy, that's what they said. But people got in the way. So, you know, I really go to the problems of, with these, the veterans today coming home. You have no idea. And I didn't either until I got into this book. Next slide. And I asked my mom, could you draw a page for the book? Oh, Carol, I don't know, oh, honey, that's your thing. And she'd had this stroke. So one day I just mixed up some colors for her and I sat her down at the table. I said, you do a page. Do anything you want. Maybe I'll use it on the front of the book. Oh, honey, I don't know. And she came up with this like beautiful thing. 1943 is when they got married. There's the two hearts, mom and dad, in love. And then she, 44 was when Anne was born, 48 Joe, 46 my sister Virginia, 51 me and Jimmy, 1960. See, we're all over here, we're living. Anne died, and see, she put tears coming out of Anne's thing, because she was two and a half when she died. And I was just like blown away, because she could, you know, she was like, Half of her head didn't work, and yet she found a way to really convey em, em, an emotion that we thought was kind of fl had flattened. So, next slide. And I talk about it in this page, you know, where I'm asking her to draw, and she's saying, why are you always telling people our family business? I don't know if I'll be able to do this right. She always had reservations. And, you know, I was trying to show how half of her head didn't work, right? And she was shaky on this side. And I said, wow, this is great. Mom, you did a beautiful job. I love the chrysanthemums. And she said, oh, those aren't flowers. They're stars in bloom. Yeah. OK. And then um, I, <laughs> this was like, I had this up the whole time I was working. You know, how to live a long life, it says up there. No smoking, you know, family. Uh, plant-based diet, more soy, be socially engaged. These are my things that I picked up. Okay, my dad's smoke, drink, do everything wrong. Try to get, for, hope you get forgiven and forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, he's 94. He's still going. Um, and then at a different time, not far from that, I had had all these scraps of paper. Mom picked this up and wrote out for me, Carol, you'll ever know that I love you. So she's being awesome again. Always awesome. OK. Um, I had to deal a lot with death in the book, you know, abstract and real. And I just, from thoughts, just kind of knowing, it was, it was like, all right, Tyler, can you draw or not? Every page is a question. Can I draw or not? So the challenge on this page was, can you do a perspective of tombstones on a, on a hillside? Oh, God, OK. So I worked on that for a long time. But this is towards the end of the book when the palette got muted. But uh, I did have to look at some Arlington pictures. If, you've ever, if you haven't been to Arlington, you need to go. Go ahead. That's how I feel when I got done. I could, I could commiserate with this fellow. Completely. And there's Dad at, uh, uh, he, he's involved with the VFW, and it was a Memorial Day service. But OK, uh, one of the things I do, next slide, out of this, because I teach at University of Cincinnati, I teach comics, graphic novels, and sequential art. And every, I teach a basic and then advanced. And what I have my advanced students do is we bring veterans to the class. My students interview them. And then they do a comic page about their story. So this is a samples of them being in the classroom or in a meeting room. And the students are taking notes to then turn around and turn them into um, stories. 
Okay, this is to remind me that I'm close to the end and to don't go to my website because it's old. <laughs> you can catch me on Facebook. Go ahead. That's the way it is at home. Be glad you're in California next. <laughs> okay. All the old dogs you just saw are gone. And my mom passed away, as I told you. And I had the worst year of my life this last year. My sister has cancer. It's terrible. It's terrible. Everything's terrible. My house got robbed. My, sister, my daughter's car got stolen. I mean, just uh, think of something terrible. It's happened. And then this dog showed up. This funny, lively thing came to the door. She came on January 2nd, and Justin said, he calls up, there's a dog on the porch. I said, forget it, I don't want a dog. Wait a minute, two is here. Two. There's two. T-U-E spelled T-U-E, and there's my house in Ohio, and I'm up there, and the lady that puts all, oh, it's a fuzzy picture. Of, all the plants and stuff, those trellises I built, and all that whole book was written upstairs, just behind those two windows. Okay, I have a new thing I'm working on now. Uh, had the flu, I had a fever for 22 days after coming back from being in, at, in uh, Paris and Portugal. I don't recommend it. You know, you're in bed sick. I couldn't move. I had joint involvement. Terrible, weird, weird. And I just kept looking out the window thinking about how sad everything is I ate this year. The phone rang and this man said, hi, this is Cincinnati Magazine calling. How would you like to do the inside back page of our magazine? And I was like, yes. A, 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 a regular gig, monthly basis. For as long as you want, you can say anything you want. Yes! Yes, it was just like in Gone with the Wind when she's like, got the carrots or whatever, <laughs> right? So the new dog, the new day, and I'm working on um, the back page is about um, living in, on my street for the last 10 years, trying to do a book, but also trying to grow tomatoes. It's called Tomatoes. It's really not about growing tomatoes. It's about human interaction, you know that. I can't just do gardening stuff, so come to my porch anytime. You're welcome. Come to Cincinnati and see me. I think that's my like last thing, right? I think so. Who left that trash can on the porch? <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got some time for questions from the audience. We're asking if you could line up at the mics if you have questions you'd like to ask. Um, Wait, how many are my Facebook friends that are here? <gasps> FB rocks. Go ahead. What else? So hopefully. Oh, during yes. question and answer, I said I'd put my hat on. Okay. I brought this hat. We, we're trying to record it, so if trying you could. Trying to record it, so you got to go to the thing. Couldn't resist thrift store. What do you think? It's cute, isn't it? Hey, so Carol, you mentioned Kurtzman as an example of kind of what you you thought you would be expected, but you were divulging from. Uh, did you find any inspiration from his anti-war stuff? No. No? Okay. I don't read comics. <laughs> Honestly, enough. I don't. I don't. I've, I've never been oriented. Why am I a cartoon or doing comics? This has always been a strange thing for me. Um, I don't have a history of reading comics. I did read Binky Brown, and I've read The Undergrounds and The Alternatives and some of that stuff. I don't read anything that comes out today. I'm sorry. I, I, don't have I haven't had time. Maybe now I will. But a couple of my reasons for that are, um, it goes back to art school where you know, you'd make a painting and somebody would say, oh, that looks too much like Matisse. And you'd go, OK, because you're trying to be like original and find your original thing. And so I got very hyper aware of not wanting to appropriate anyone's energy or imagery or voice. So I pretty much work in a, I, I know there's a guy that lives downstairs named Justin. We don't, there's nothing sure. with anybody. Kurtzman, the reason why I know Kurtzman is because I teach that as teaching comics. I, I assign my students assignments to, to read about cartoonists. So I don't um, really have, I, I'm not a good person to look for, to look towards for comics referencing and things like that. Very inadequate. I try to be 
You know, I'm a storyteller. I'm trying to find the right way to get something across. Gee whiz, I wish I, I, wish I could. I wish I was like, you know, I'm embarrassed about it, but not intentionally. I, I, it just goes back to the old school thing. I mean, I read Mad. I did look at comics and stuff like that, although my brother would cream me if I went into his comic books when I was a kid. So and my sister never, never, never let me look at her Archies. So um, I just didn't look at anything. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Next. Yeah, uh, not to stick with this one subject too much, but what uh, other educational techniques have you found work well with your students, especially those beginning students? You haven't really talked about that yet. Especially with the what students? Beginning students. You mentioned oh, what the do advanced I do? class is what you do. but You know, yeah. it's amazing. I, um, they come in, I don't know what they think, but I really kind of go old school. In other words, mm -hmm. I make them get, they have to go buy a bottle of ink and become pen dippers, you know? And I tell them about how, you know, you rule panel borders by hand, how to come up with an idea script. I have them part of the time turn to themselves for content. I spend most of my time cheerleading them and reminding them of deadlines. Um, they think that, oh, comics, man, I can just do this the night before. And then, <laughs> you know, the results are obvious. So, um, you know, I, I, I do have them do reports. I call them Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Jimmy Olsen reports. And I have hats that they wear. There's a fedora and a pill box and stuff. They uh, bow tie for Jimmy Olsen. They have to report on three artists. And I make sure I cover everything. And if, they're off of, if it's off of Wikipedia, they get an F. And I, I know these people. So I know. I, don't want, I said, I don't want to hear Robert Crumb was born in 19, you know. I was like, shut up. Do you, have you read his work? No. Hmm. So I make them buy the books, read the material. And sometimes we sit in class. I have, do you know, in school they call it SSR. Sustained silent reading. So on Wednesdays, the first 20 minutes of class, we have SSR for comics. And they have to read books. Now, I, I just don't get, I don't get into the web comic level, not because I hate that or anything like that. I just have said to them, there's traditions out there. You need to know this is from the print medium. There is a tradition involved. Let's learn it. And so that when you actually look at a comic, you're going to know that you know people didn't just go. Okay, they, there's time spent, hours, hours are spent on this kind of stuff. So, you know, then when I drag them to the OSU, Ohio State University, uh, Billy Ireland Library of Cartoon Art, and they see the original Windsor McKay's and stuff like that, they're like, oh God, you know, they get it, <laughs> and which which you should, and. I just hate to say it, but some of the web comic stuff I read now, it's just like, <laughs> how can I get away with this? And they, it's popular. My God, where's, where, where's the artistry? You know, I'm a aesthetician. Is that the right word? I'm for the aesthetics of it. I create art as much as, you know, getting a story across. I want my originals, which are right now crammed into that old suitcase there. Super Bowl suitcase. Um, I want those to prevail. I want those to be seen as art. And I try to make sure that my students know that they're creating art as well as conveying some content. Thanks. I can identify with a lot of that history that you talked about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. More questions? Stand up and ask. Come on. Anybody got anything to say? Dunk, dunk. Yeah, yeah, yes. Go over there. Gotta go to the or mother. over there, whichever. This one over here. Hi, I have a question. Um, What's your name? Oh, no, you don't have to say it because of the thing, but like. Tasha. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a question. I know that your story with your dad kind of fell into your lap as like a passion project, but um, any advice? for like the times when you're not necessarily inspired, how do you stay in shape drawing something like 30 minutes a day or something? What do you do to get yourself 
So whatever you do, some, some advice for keeping sharp when you're not inspired by something. Every single day I have to start over reminding myself if I can do it or not. I'm never sure. There's no such thing as being in shape for me. I struggle with it constantly. I don't, okay, I just did 350 pages, right? Since any magazine calls, yeah, I can do that. So part of me says, yeah, and then I'll sit down and I'll go, I'm a fraud. How am I gonna do this? You know, at any moment, it's just all gonna be gone because it's just puffs, right? Um, I've just had to train myself. I'm heavy on uh, writing. So I have, you know, taken the journal book, ladies sitting there with a funny hat on, you know, but yet, you know, a, some other little piece of observation, I'll throw it in there. So I've got a bookshelf at home full of journals with content. Anybody's looking for content? Boy, I've got it. I've been observing this, you know, I've got journals I kept in when I was 14 about seeing the Beatles. I've got journals from when I was in high school, on and on and on. Journals that are just like, that son of a bitch, that's that journal, you know, mad at somebody. This one's about, oh, my baby, and I love her, and she's cute. Um, so I've kept my observational head tuned in. I've also been awake to the fact that I can't remember a damn thing if I don't write it down. I don't. But then how can I remember what was on the coffee table in my house in 1965? I don't know. Certain things stick. Certain things don't. My high school friends on Facebook will say, oh, I remember the time when you did such and such, and you know, I don't remember that. We all have that experience, it's the same. But to be a, an artist, a cartoonist, the hardest thing for me is the drawing. I, I really have to fight for it. Um, the writing is like a conversation, and I think it's because it's been so fluid for me for so many years in the, um, journals. And even when I had the baby thing, you know, you saw the baby. I had a box I kept right there like under the place where the telephone was and I always had scraps of paper and I, oh, two El Caminos, both orange, going by at the same time. I'd write that down, double duo taco trucks, you know, I call them that, and put that in the box and maybe in the future I'll do something with that. So I kept that. And so I've also trained my mind to be to pay attention to every moment, this is from my uh, meditation practice, because at every moment is new and simultaneously new and extinct, and so I have to be awake or I'll miss it. So I try not to miss a thing. So you shared with me this video this afternoon that sort of comes to mind as you're telling the story. Yeah. I don't have it to be able to show at the moment, but could you tell us a little about the video? Another motivational technique for my students and for anyone who works in the medium I was in the hospital, I had major surgery. So I took my little camera that now takes little movies and I showed my IV to prove I was there. And I had this pad of paper and I felt like shit and I was like, I'm in the hospital. I just had surgery. But then I show on the page, it says, but the theme of this video is draw no matter what. When my mother, I showed you the baby, the dog, 16 years old, we'd been, I'd been patching it together, walking her down the stairs to go to the bathroom. She'd stand there and fall over. It was just pitiful. Finally, the day came I had to put her down. And that started this horrible chain of events that's been bad news for a year and a half, but it's gone now. But when it started, it started with getting baby put down. And right after that, I got a call that my mom was ailing. She ended up in the hospital. She ended up in a coma. They had terminal cancer. They kept her there for a while. They put her in the nursing home. In the meantime, I had to run home. My sister, who was my co-helper with mom, is in the hospital with me. She starts saying, oh, my tummy hurts. It feels like my cell phone's in there. Oh, it's crazy, it's crazy. And I'm like, yo, just eat more yogurt, you know, it helps. Running back and forth on the freeway. She's teaching, I'm teaching, back and forth. Just put the dog, okay, run. mom's sick, mom's in, oh no, mom's in a coma. Run back, okay, 
Oh, mom needs soup. I'm gonna make soup. I'm gonna make soup for mom. Oh, wait a minute, I got a page to do. I gotta page this page. Okay, the thing's boiling. I'm writing down stuff for the book. The book is due, remember, this book has to be done. Kim Thompson needs it by a certain date because it's gotta be out by correct. So I'm running back and forth from the nursing home to the hospital. Hot, wait a minute, hospital. Turns out my sister, oh, 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 ends up in the emergency room. Tuesday, I got somebody cover my class. Justin, go to the class. I gotta go, Jenna's in the hospital. Okay, her husband has Alzheimer's, her daughter has autism. I have to take care of Harry and Joy and Jenna, why are you in the hospital? Oh, no, no, I got two of no, them, this and that, kidney, blah, blah, blah. Turns out she's got stage four ovarian cancer. Oh, now I have to tell my family. How am I gonna tell mom? She just came out of a coma. She's in a nursing home. We're just getting her to talk and walk again. And yet she's terminal too. What's that? Dad fell. Holy God, the VA, just, I'll be right there. Joy, Joy, come on. I can't go, I don't have my books. Joy, come on, get in the car, we're going to see Grandpa. But I don't have my books. Get your books and let's go, we gotta see Grandpa. The rescue squad is there, they're taking Dad away. I'm running around with my pages, trying to get the book done. Boom, boom, boom. This is my, I had a deadline. But I also had people falling off cliffs all around me and tragic things happening. And I, I couldn't breathe, there were times when I couldn't breathe, but I was dipping the pen, Mom and I were watching, I, I was fully aware of the fact this is the last time we're going to watch the Nutcracker together. But I was dipping the pen, lettering part of the book. So, you draw no matter what is the answer. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, maybe you've sort of answered this already with your discussion about aesthetics. Um, and I guess this goes back to also how uh, Professor Jenkins framed this around material culture as well, is uh, have you considered using photos for your images as opposed to drawing? And why do you stick to drawing if you haven't considered that? Um, I have to draw everything. Okay. You know, if I just like were to collage, put a picture there, it wouldn't seem like, mm, it's a different medium, it's a photograph. And I'm having to texture thing. Blah, blah, blah colors, and all that, I can't do that if I just stick a photograph there. It's just a different feeling. It's like, oh, I'm having a salad. Wait a minute, why is there a cookie in there? <laughs> right? It doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. An Oreo, the something. Okay. Well, I, I one other, uh, one, come one, on. one last person, well, one last, last, person. last question, and we will wrap we things up. Hi. Uh, you, uh, besides being, you know, a amazing artist, you're an Thank avid, uh, uh, sorry, uh, reader and, and writer. And I was wondering what uh, pieces of literature really may have inspired you the most uh, in, and I, maybe it's a weird question, but no, it's if not. you could sum it up. But you're gonna hear a story from me. Um, That's natural. <laughs> I was in the Bluebirds group. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, yeah, being thanks. born in November, I got sent to school at age four as a kindergartner. So my mind wasn't ready to read. Therefore, I got labeled a dummy. And the kids laughed at me because I was the one that was going the, 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 buh, buh. We'll put her in the slow readers group. Okay. So it has nothing to do with intellect or creativity. It means that not only did I not enjoy reading, I mean, I love it now, but I didn't learn to love that. I didn't slip in through the window at the right time. But if I did try to read, my dad would say, what the hell are you doing sitting around reading for? We got work to do. So there was no pleasure reading at home, no fun reading anything except looking at the pictures of Life Magazine, and stuff like that, maybe watching some TV. Um, so I've had, always had trouble with big blocks of text. It's like daunting. As I get older, it's even starting to come back where I just go, oh, I can't read that. Um, in terms of enjoying literature and writers and stuff like that, see, that whole world's closed to me because it was such a struggle. I had to read text. I've had to learn to read 
nonfiction, you know, army books, yeah. But even before that, in college, you know, reading college stuff. And they'd say, OK, you're going to take a literature class. You're going to read something. I'd be hoping for short stories because I still, I have still, I can maybe three or four books in my whole life I've read cover to cover. But, but I'm always aware of the fact that it's like, oh my god, I just read like four pages. That's good, you know, that's good, Tyler. But in terms of like being able to go literature, like my daughter, who was reading at age, and she was the one who would have been taunting me, you can't, you can't read, write, or something like that. She said, Mom, I used to laugh at kids like you. Oh, shut up. I'm gonna spank you right now. Um, so I, I kind of, I think that's why I ended up just watching the world, observing, watching how people talk and maybe some spit comes out funny or their hair's crooked, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I think I got that because I couldn't be absorbed in a book. And I had to watch. I also had to shut up because I was the, little, the littlest one and had the lowest perspective and would spend time because nothing was ever expected of me and I didn't have to do anything except be, you know, scowled at by my siblings and stuff and told to shut up. So that actually, that's my whole, my whole world growing up was like this. Watching, listening to dialogue, you know, knowing sounds. I, I had to sign uh, emotion to color and sound and assign <coughs> sounds to color. So there's all this stuff that you see that comes out in the book. Those are all th strategies I had to adapt. I guess maybe communication strategies because I didn't have the normal type of thing. Um, I wasn't allowed to hold court like today's kids where everybody's fabulous and wonderful. Tell me about your day. Nobody ever cared about my day, you know? I'd have to go get a bag, paper bag, open it up, get my colors. Oh, they stink, those crayon things. And color something. And while I would be listening to the family doing their thing, and then I could just kind of zone out, which is, I guess, what I'm still doing. Well, Carol, thanks so much for sharing your life and your work with us. Thank you. So we have some of Carol's books for sale upstairs in the East Lobby, and she'll be up there shortly to sign books and talk to, talk to people and so forth. So and thanks also, for coming. Take a moment to come and look at this junk before I pack it up. Thank you.